that beautiful sermon and song. Indeed, as you have already figured out, the focus of the messages, as they always should be, and as you are accustomed to, the focus is, the focus is not about us. The focus is God and God alone. Uh, he is the object of our worship. He is the reason for our being here. Uh, he is the reason why we live. Once again, thank you, choir. Let's pray. Father, thank you for once again bringing us here into your house of worship. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit in this place. We thank you, as we did this morning, for the prayers that we have prayed, for the songs that we have sung, and we hope that everything that has been done has been pleasing in your sight. Uh, for we know that we have done our best to do everything to your name's honor and glory. Once again, as we open your word, we ask that you will speak to our hearts Lift us to a higher place and do within us what you would desire to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It was the defining event in Jewish history. It started innocently with the descendants of Jacob settling in the land of Goshen. I can imagine that for them, they felt it would be a very temporary sojourn. But the next thing they knew, they and their descendants were there for hundreds of years. As time passed along, they became bountiful, they also became fruitful. They also became no longer wanted or desired by the Egyptians. They were there for hundreds of years because they were enslaved for hundreds of years. And the Bible tells us that theirs was an unpleasant existence. The Word of God tells us in Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage. And they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 24 once again said, so God heard their groaning. This morning we talked about God sees. This afternoon we talk about God hears, the God who hears. The Bible is very clear, very plain, that when we cry out, God hears us. And for me, the good news concerning this is God did not only hear the children of Israel, but God hears us when we groan and when we cry out. Now, let me tell you right now that there are some in this world, there in fact are even some Christians who, who 
announce, who proclaim to us that in our Christian journey, we should always experience happiness. We should always be joyful. And that sounds good, and in fact, that is the ideal, for in Christ, we experience joy. But you know, and I know, that in this Christian walk, while Christ is the source of our joy, while he is the source of our contentment, there come those times when we find that we need to cry out. There come those times when our spirit groans within us. And I would like to say to each one of us this afternoon that there is nothing wrong with sharing our agony. There's nothing wrong with sharing our grief. There is nothing wrong with sharing our pain. We see that in the scriptures. We see that throughout the Word of God. Before we take a look at some examples in God's Word about this, let me hasten to add that while there is nothing wrong with sharing our agony, we do not do so in order for others to have pity on us. We don't do so because we wish to pity ourselves. Because when we have pity on ourselves, when we want others to feel sorry for us, what usually happens is we, in the long term, turn into angry people. God does not want us to cry out because we want people to feel sorry for us. He wants us to cry out because he is the God who hears and he is the God who can do something about it. There's a way to handle everything. The Psalms teach us this. For indeed, the book of Psalms is a book that is full of laments to God. Once again, it would be wonderful if we could go through life smiling about everything. If everything was just wonderful, with no problems, no stresses, no disappointments, no heartaches. But the Bible makes it plain that such is not the case. If we had the time, we could look at so many different psalms of lament. But I just wish for us to take a look at two of them very briefly without, uh, without dwelling on them for too long. Psalm chapter 55. This is how David begins this psalm. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. Lest I move too quickly in this verse, notice what was in the beginning of this verse. Give ear. What is David asking for? Hear me when I am distressed. Listen to me when I am anguished. Give ear to my prayer, O God. Verse 2, give heed to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint, and I am surely distracted because of the voice of the enemy, because of the pressure of the wicked. Well, they bring down trouble upon me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. How often have you, like David, wanted relief from the pressures of this life. You didn't know what to do. You didn't know where to go. You did not know to whom you could turn. If that's how you feel, 
David felt the same way also. This isn't the only time that a psalmist felt this way. There is a psalm of Asaph, one that is probably better known, Psalm 73. He starts so promisingly, surely God is good to Israel, Psalm 73, verse 1, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. And then he continues on in this chapter. Verse 12, Behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease. They have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. Notice what the psalmist is saying here. Why, God, does it seem like the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? Good things happen to them, but bad things happen to us. Verse 16, when I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight until I came into the sanctuary of God. Notice that in his anguish, in his heartache, he recognized when he asked himself, what do I do? Where do I go? To whom do I turn? The answer clearly came back to him. You turn to the God who hears. You turn to the God who listens to your anguish. It's very important for us this afternoon to know that we can share our concerns with God because sharing, especially with God, leads to our betterment. Studies have shown that when we express ourselves in a proper and appropriate way, and as Christians we do this to God and to others who love and care for us, when we share, such sharing leads to mental health. It leads to physical healing. Let's always remember that it's all right to groan. It's all right to cry out. Why? Because when we do so, we have the assurance that God hears. And like the children of Israel, not only did God hear them, but God does something about it when we cry out and he hears. But let's be honest. Let's be real. How many times have you gotten on your knees and you prayed to God and you have said, Lord, I have this issue. I have this problem. I am facing this challenge. There are these difficulties that surround me. Hear my prayer, O oh Lord. Listen to me and do something about it. How many times have we prayed a prayer like this and it seems like God just isn't listening? Have you ever been there before? Have you ever felt like God hears everyone else's prayers, but he's not hearing your prayers? Sometimes God seems silent. Sometimes he even seems absent. But if you feel that way, the Word of God assures us that we are not the only ones who have felt that way. For even in the Garden of Gethsemane, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, went through that very same valley 
through that very valley as David would have referred to it, the, the valley of the shadow of death. For in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, we hear, uh, well, even before that, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus cried out, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus, on the cross in Matthew 27, verse 46 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever felt that you fight these battles by yourself? Have you ever felt alone? Have you ever felt that there's no one else who listens and who cares? The good news today for each one of us is that while we feel that we are alone, even as Jesus felt that he was alone, God never abandoned his son and God the Father never abandons you and God the Father never abandons me. All alone, God is there. He's suffering with us. In fact, as we suffer, God suffers even more. But while he is suffering with us, we have the assurance that God is paving the way. What did the psalmist say? I almost lost my way until I entered the sanctuary. That's when I saw that God is making a way. That's when I saw that God knows what's going on. Why does God hear? Why does he listen to us? Why can we be assured that even in our darkest moments, in our most trying of times, why do we know, how do we know that God is listening to us when we cry out to him? I would like to share two reasons right now. We can be assured that God listens to us, that God hears us because of his covenant. The covenant that he made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. The covenant that he will be our God. That's how we know he hears and listens. I love the words of Psalm 100, the 100th Psalm. Perhaps many of us could recite it from memory, from verse 1 all the way through verse 5. But I love verse 3. I love all of these verses. But I love verse 3. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. How do I know God hears? I know that God hears me because of the covenant. He has made us a promise, and we know because he has said so. He is our God, and we are his people. He is our shepherd, and we are his sheep. He is the one who leads us. We need to always remember that we are connected with God. And we are connected with God for two reasons. We are connected to God through creation. Not only is he our God, but he is our Father. As was mentioned in the introduction this morning, I'm a father. God has blessed my wife and me with two children. And yes, our children are older now. Our children are adults but they're still our children. And our children know and they understand that never is there a time when they cannot come to us. Never is there a time when they cry out and we don't hear them. Never is there a time when they have a need 
and we don't respond. What they do is they cry out and we hear. They speak and we listen. Why? Because we are their parents. And God is the same. We are his children through creation. He is our father. We are his sons and daughters. Never is there ever a time when we cry out and he doesn't listen. I love the words of Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 37, where in that verse we have the assurance that when we come to Jesus, he will not ever cast us aside. He will not ever push us away. Why? Because he's our father, we're his children, he created us, and he loves us. Not only are we connected by creation, but we are connected by the cross. We serve a God. We serve a Savior who gave up the glories of heaven, who came down here to this earth, who lived a life not for himself, but for us. Isaiah chapter 53 says that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He took on himself our anguish so that we might experience his joy. He took on our sorrows that we might experience his righteousness. We serve a God and Savior who hung on a cross for us. And because of his life and because of his death, we have the assurance that he hears us. No one would ever go through as much as Jesus went through without loving us. No one would ever give his life for us like Jesus did unless he loves us. That's how I know, that's how you know, that's how we know that when we cry out to God, he listens and he hears us and he responds. And that's the good news for us today because not only does God listen, not only does he hear, but we serve a God who acts. We just read in the beginning of this message from the end of Exodus chapter 2. The children of Israel were distressed. They cried out. God heard their cry. And what did he do about it? Exodus chapter 3 begins the rest of the story. The story that continues for several more chapters. For in Exodus chapter 3, we have introduced to us the call of Moses. God heard the children of Israel and he brought them a deliverer. God heard their cry and he appointed someone who would be the one to lead them to the promised land. And today we need to know, we need to understand that when we cry out, God delivers. When we express our deepest wishes to him, he hears us. When we reach out to him, he stands ready to answer. When we need him to act, God is ready to act. This afternoon, I ask you, do you need an Exodus event? I ask that question 
because the exodus was not just for the children of Israel. The exodus is for us as well. The children of Israel needed deliverance. And I ask you today, do you need deliverance? You may be asking, what do I need deliverance from? We all need deliverance from something. Maybe we need deliverance from sickness. God stands ready to act. Perhaps we need deliverance from sinful behavior. God stands ready to act. Perhaps we need deliverance from unhealthy relationships. All we need to do is cry out to God. God, Savior, I need you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. The children of Israel were hapless. They were helpless. In their minds, they felt hopeless. What could they do? What, how could they deliver themselves? They couldn't, but God could. And this afternoon, as you hear the voice of God, the Holy Spirit speaking to you, perhaps you're under conviction right now and you recognize the sin that is within you. You have tried, you have tried, you have tried again to bring yourself victory, deliverance, salvation, and you find that you are hopeless and that you are helpless. You cry out to God and you say, Lord, I can't take it anymore. Lord, I need you to help me. Maybe there are people in your life who are holding you back. Unhealthy relationships, stress, struggles, and you're saying, Lord, I need deliverance. I need rescue. I need emancipation. I need freedom. I'm so glad today that we serve a God that when we cry out, he hears, he listens, and he stands ready to act. All we need to do is cry out. All we need to do is ask God to step in and deliver us. But in order to do this, we have to recognize and acknowledge the situation. And when we do, God is ready to come to the rescue. <laughs> 